They said, well, no, 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 no. You, you, you love football if you play football, and when you're done playing and you can no longer play, then you coach. And if you don't coach, then you die. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know? So that, he is all ball. He is all about ball. You play as long as you can, you coach as long as you can, then you die. That, that's Jim Harbaugh. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. Today is Friday, January 5th. We hope you're having a terrific week. We're finally recovered from the trip to New Orleans. Game that went deep into the night. I think I left the Superdome at like 1 o'clock local. It was late. But either way, it was a blast and it was amazing. Amazing. After the fact, to see the numbers and the viewership from both the Rose Bowl and the Sugar Bowl. Combined, like 23, 24 million people tuned in over the course of an eight-hour period to consume college football. The sport has never been stronger. The sport, I don't think, is going anywhere. If anything, guys, I think we are just going to continue to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more people are kind of finding our sport, man. We are awesome. So I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. Can't wait for the game coming up on Monday. We have everybody here. We got Jack here. We got the other Jack here. We got Jake. I'm Greg. Mark's here as well. We got the whole team here because it's National Championship Preview Day. We're going to hit every storyline. There's three that I think are most impactful in the game. We're going to give you a couple key players to keep an eye on. Give you a couple stories about both coaches. We're going to break these teams down. How'd they get here? And then a little bit later in the show, we're going to talk about how their roster was put together because a lot of people out there are thinking, man, we just can't compete. We can't do it. We don't recruit at a high enough level. Well, you're going to be really pleased with what you hear here today because both Washington and Michigan, neither are putting together year after year of top five classes. So there is hope. And there is a chance, and based on these two teams' performances, there might be a recipe in there for a team that maybe someday could cycle up and play on a stage like this. So let's start by breaking down the national championship, and we're going to hit it from every possible angle. We're going to go players, we're going to go storylines, we're going to go keys, we're going to do it all. And this weekend preview is brought to you by Dr. Pepper. It's not college football season without the delicious taste of an ice cold Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. The championship is upon us and we have a great matchup contrast and styles. I'm not sure you could find two teams that are more different, whether it's the coaching personalities, the identities of either team, uh, the way that one team really relies heavily on the pass and the big play and their team wants to play ball control and at one point handed it off 42 consecutive times. These teams could not be more different. They also, I think, are built in a unique way. They're not teams that have had an identity at which they've really leaned into the portal. They have not gone heavy after five stars, but they are a senior-laden group on both sides. Both teams very veteran. Uh, A lot of sixth-year players, great leadership. And I honestly think, we look at both teams, culture now wins. Now, culture doesn't win by itself. Okay, I'm not naive enough to think that, well, we love each other in this locker room, so we're going to win the national championship. No, but I really think that these two teams have a very close knit group. Washington's been able to rally behind the fact that nobody thought they could do it except for us. Of course, we had a number one in the country about three months ago, but a lot of people doubted them. A lot of people thought they couldn't get it done. And here they are. They've proven the doubters wrong. They sit here at 14 and 0, one win away from an undefeated national championship. Conversely, on the other side, Michigan has embraced the villain role with everything that's gone down and the adversity that they've had to face, whether it be in the offseason and the recruiting violations and the three game suspension and the Connor Stallion situation, another three game suspension. They kind of developed a foxhole mentality. They were, hey, Who's got it better than us is what they say, but it's Michigan against the world, right? So these two teams have really become very close knit in spite of doubt and adversity. Okay. That's not going to be what decides the game on, 
on Monday night. I'm sorry. I, I know that that sounds fun and rosy and exciting, but no, it's going to be about the X's and the O's. And that's what we're here to break down. Storytelling is a big part of these two teams. No doubt about it. There's a story involving both teams and we like to dive into that to an extent, but that's not going to be where we live. We go a layer deeper, as you guys know, here on Always College Football. Let's start with the fact that the Pac-12 teams are one and three in BCS and college football playoff national championship games. They've lost three straight. Their only win for the conference came by USC in the 2004 season, 2005 national championship. The 250 win percentage is tied with the Big 12, who went two and six for the worst in any conference. Of course, the Big 12 had two champions in Oklahoma back in 2000, and then the Texas Longhorns, who won in 2005. Michigan and Washington are going to be in the same conference next year, which is very exciting. So those that are fans of the Big Ten, and we've seen you in the comments section, bang the drum, man, without question, bang the drum. They are going to be in the in the same league next year, and they actually, as, as crazy as it may be, they're going to play each other on October 5th in Seattle. So this is a preview for what's coming in 24. No, I kid, but this is going to be an awesome matchup. Let's start with Kalen DeBoer. Uh, I still, even though he's been around for a little bit now, I don't know how much people know about him. And I had never met him prior to calling the Sugar Bowl. It's the first time I'd been around him. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I meet a lot of coaches. Uh, I've been around a lot of guys. I have been very fortunate to have been around a lot of programs and a lot around a lot of players. And, have, and I've got to spend spend a lot of time and in and, 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 and intimate settings too, not, you know, in a, in a media day setting where I'm holding a microphone and asking them questions in front of a camera or on a recording device. No, I've, it's been off the record conversation. And I will tell you this, Kalen DeBoer is as impressive a guy as I've been around. And I, you know me, I don't just throw flowers at everybody. I, I mean, I've, I've had plenty of, there's plenty of coaches, I wouldn't say it, but there's plenty of coaches that I just, I've kind of been rubbed the wrong way by. It just kind of bothersome, uh, whether they're paranoid or anxious or they're uptight or they're, you know, they're accusatory or they're combative. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of coaches that kind of, and look, it's a high pressure job. I'm not, I'm not going to blame them for feeling the way they feel, but Kalen DeBoer is probably as approachable and as normal uh, guy, as I've have probably been around, it's it's really remarkable, and the team plays loose under the circumstances because I think he's loose. I mean, he's very much under control, very much the same guy every day. And if you talk to the staff, if you talk to the players, they'll tell you, "Yeah, man, what you see is what you get." It, it's it's kind of off putting, but which is why in, in the biggest moments this year. Washington has always seemed to make the play necessary to win the game. I think their coach is never too high with the highs, never too low with the lows, and he's done a terrific job in his second season at Washington. I mean, last year they were 11-2. and two. Now they've taken a big step forward, and with the win on Monday, he'd become the first head coach since Gene Chiswick in 2010 at Auburn to win a national championship within their first two seasons at the school couple other guys that have done this it's, it's pretty remarkable urban or meyer has done this one in his second season at florida so there's it's a, it's a pretty short list of guys that have won championships within their first two years jim harbaugh on the other hand people are more familiar with jim harbaugh uh, a personal anecdote with jim harbaugh i had retired and had gone into broadcasting and and I had gotten to know Coach Harbaugh through the draft process and and had developed a pretty good relationship uh, with Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck was my roommate at the Manning Passing Academy. So in a, in a roundabout way, everyone, by the way, everyone kind of knows everyone. It's, it, you know, it's a small world, this college football world. But in a roundabout way, uh, kind of got to know Jim Harbaugh through that. And then he took the Niners job and kind of went through that process. With it. So just got to know him kind of over the course of time. And I remember seeing him at the Big Ten Media Days. It's probably 2015 or 16. I had actually worked Michigan's camp the summer before. So 13 months earlier, I was in Ann Arbor working Michigan's aerial assault camp as one of the quarterback coaches. And Jim Harbaugh approached me at Big Ten Media Days and said, 
oh, so Greg, you're done playing, huh? You're not, you're not playing anymore. I said, no, coach, I'm, you know, I decided to kind of move into this world and, you know, I've enjoyed it a lot. I love college football. It's, it's great to be back and, you know, working in the world that I'm working in. And, and it's not, you know, it's not quite as hands-on as coaching. I have a little bit more flexibility and things like that. And basically looked at me and as dry and, and as direct as you can possibly be. And he said, oh, so you don't, you don't love football? I'm like, no, I, I love football. I, I love it. I mean, football is amazing, coach. <laughs> like, I'm, I, I work in football. Like, I, I, I'm a broadcaster, but I, I work in football. No, so you, so you don't like football? I was like, coach, I love football. What are you, what are you talking about? And he said, well, no, 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 no. You, you love football if you play football. And when you're done playing and you can no longer play, then you coach. And if you don't coach, then you die. I'm like, well, <laughs> you know? so that he is all ball. He is all about ball. You play as long as you can, you coach as long as you can, then you die. That, that's Jim Harbaugh. He loves to compete. He loves the preparation. Uh, and he loves the, I think, the excitement and the energy that you get when you're on the sideline and patrolling. And he's been on the sideline for some massive moments. He, of course, had tons of success at Stanford, has had really good success, recent success at Michigan, took him a little while to kind of get things going. They were very good in 15 and 16 and all that stuff. But now he has kind of gotten over the hump and the team has accelerated to a point. And they resemble in style the teams that he had success with at Stanford in many ways, by the way. A lot of the same concepts, different presentations, but a lot of the same concepts. For instance, saw a great clip on Twitter the other day. There was a clip of Toby Gerhardt running the exact same play as what Blake Corum ran in overtime to win the Rose Bowl. The exact same play. Now, Blake Corum was an offset eye or pistol or however they lined it up, and Toby Gerhardt was under center, wing wing, fullback. I mean, the typical Stanford Jim Harbaugh offense. It's just changed a little bit, but the identity remains the same. And while he was in between those two places at Stanford and Michigan, he of course led San Francisco to Super Bowl 37, I believe. 47, I think maybe 47. I look at the Roman numerals and I struggle with it. So Super Bowl 47. And he inevitably lost to his brother, who at the time was the head coach of the Baltimore Ravens. That would be John Harbaugh. That was in New Orleans. And since the beginning of the BCS and the College Football Playoff National Championship back in 98, the only other head coach to have coached both in a national championship game and a Super Bowl is Pete Carroll. He went naturally with USC to the championship in 05 and 06. That was the national championship game year, seasons 04, 05. And then he made two trips to the Super Bowl, both in Super Bowl 48 and then Super Bowl 49. He lost there in Super Bowl 49, but was victorious in Super Bowl 48. So he has joined elite company with the win there in the Rose Bowl to punch his ticket to the national championship. Washington has won 21 straight games, uh, but that historically has not been a good thing when entering into the national title. They are the third team to enter a college football playoff championship game with a win streak of 20 plus games. The two teams that have done this prior are 2017 Alabama, 2017, 2016 season, 2017 championship game. They were riding a 26 game win streak and 2020 Clemson. That would be 2019 season 2020 Clemson. Both teams lost in the championship game. Clemson at that point had a 29 game win streak going. So it had been a while since they had lost. So looking at all that, remember Clemson went undefeated in 18, undefeated all the way up to the championship, but they fell to LSU. That would be the genesis of the 29 game win streak. But both those teams lost. Uh, the good news is for the Huskies, they are currently an underdog and they have thrived in this role under Kayla DeBoer. They are 5-0 and outright as an underdog over the last two seasons, which includes their win last Monday. Uh, against the Texas Longhorns. Have you ever dreamed of hitting the road in your very own customized Mercedes-Benz Sprinter? Follow college football all season long. 
by hitting all the biggest games in college football's most celebrated stadiums. At ESPN, we dreamed that dream, and with the help of Mercedes-Benz, we made it happen. This year, our very own Jen Latta has teamed up with Mercedes-Benz designers to create a road-ready, fully functional, state-of-the-art podcast studio on wheels. The ride is pure Mercedes-Benz with all-wheel drive and the latest driver assistance, safety, and tech. The podcast studio must be seen and heard to be believed. A spacious and chill conversation space with mics, camera, and mixing board to capture the action. On board, Jen Latta will be interviewing some of the biggest names in college football. All points to Mercedes-Benz for always bringing some extra. Out back of the Sprinter, they're innovating. Pushing the science of the tailgate, complete with grill, cooler, TV monitors, and more. This is hashtag van life meets the fan life. To get an inside look to this one-of-a-kind, blow-your-mind collaboration came together, visit mbvans.com slash Sprinter Labs. The Mercedes-Benz ESPN College Football Podcast Sprinter coming soon to a game near you. Let's we'll start with the quarterback matchup. Both are really, really effective. They're just very different. And how they're kind of asked to handle their role within the offense. Now, a lot of people, and I found this to be a very fascinating part of the discussion leading up to the Rose Bowl game. People kind of became very comfortable in describing J.J. McCarthy as a game manager. And I don't think that's a fair representation of of what he does. Like all great quarterbacks are also game managers, but not all game managers are great quarterbacks. J.J. McCarthy is a five star prospect coming out of high school. Like he is highly touted. He is a very gifted player. He just isn't asked to throw for 430 yards in an effort for Michigan to be victorious. He has to be efficient. He has to make great decisions. He has to just sometimes dink and dunk his way down the field. So his role is very different from that of Michael Penix. Michael Penix has had to drop back 504 times this year. That's the third most in the FBS, and that's nearly 200 times more than J.J. McCarthy. He's dropped back just 314 times. That is tied for 64th in the FBS. Michael Penix has 35 touchdowns this year. That's T3 to go along with a career high an FBS high, excuse me, and career high, I might add, 73 completions of 20 plus yards. You know how many 20 plus yard completions JJ McCarthy has? Well, he has 27 less than Michael Penix, which if you can do some quick math, that's 46 completions of 20 plus yards. Still a very good number. It's just Penix is at another level with the downfield passes. Now, he has started against Michigan in the past. That was back in 2020. He was actually at Indiana. He went 30 for 50 for 342, three touchdowns, and actually beat the Wolverines 38 to 21. Uh, He had six completions that day that went for 20 plus yards. But that was in a weird time for Michigan. Remember, they weren't very good. They were not very good. So Michael Penix and the team that he played against back then is very different than the team he's going to be playing against this week. Now, Penix has had a historically great season, 4,600 yards, 4,648 to be exact. It's the most in Washington history. And he's the first player with 4,500 plus passing yards in consecutive seasons since Patrick Mahomes back in 2015, 2016. If you're unfamiliar with who Patrick Mahomes is, I just can't help you. But that's pretty good company to be in. When describing quarterback play, he's also the first player to do it in consecutive seasons in Pac-12 history. Entering bowl season, 19% of his pass attempts traveled at least 20 yards downfield. That's the highest rate in the Pac-12 and the 13th highest rate in the FBS. Just so you understand, the highest rate that Michigan saw this year was actually Talia Tungavailoa. He threw it downfield 15% of the time. So still, they've seen someone that is willing to toss it downfield, but clearly when you look at Talia, not nearly as efficient on the downfield pass as what Michael Penix is capable of doing. So ridiculously accurate on the downfield. 
on those 40 passes where he's just pushing it way down the field, I mean, he's got an unbelievable completion percentage. Unbelievable completion percentage. So 53% of his passes that travel 30 or more yards downfield, and I said this on the broadcast in the Sugar Bowl because it's mind-boggling to think about. Passes that are traveling 30 yards in the air, he's completing 53% of those passes. That's an absurd statistic. So he's asked to do a lot. He's the star. He's the guy that Michigan must defend if they want to be victorious. McCarthy, I'm not going to talk as much about him because his contributions to the offense are more pre-snap with decision-making, the occasional RPO. Not a lot, but the occasional RPO. And more methodical in the passing game. That's why he's completed 73% of his passes. That's the third best in the FBS. And he's got a 22-4 and touchdown-to-interception ratio, which is the 10th best in the country. But I always have thought McCarthy, if needed, could do more. It's in there, and it might be needed in this game if the defense doesn't play very well. A little bit of ideology here before we dive into the key matchups. Michigan is an offense that is somewhat comparable to Texas. Now, you're going to say, hang on a second. They're, they're not, Michigan, maybe not crazy deep at receiver. Um, they're re- way more run focused. They're going to use more big bodies in their personnel groupings. Yes, all that is very true. But Michigan is a motion-based offense, just like Texas is. Michigan uses motion on 58% of their plays. That's the third highest in the country behind Florida and LSU. Texas was around 53%. So Texas is up there, and Washington is already prepared for a team that likes to really hit it on the move and hit it on the run. So that application from what they practiced in their bowl prep leading up to the Sugar Bowl will be apt applicable in this game as well. So Michigan's going to change the picture and it's going to force Washington to communicate on the fly. And if Washington can do that, they have a real chance of maybe slowing things down a little bit. There's three matchups that I think determine this game. Number one, can Michigan create pressure against Michael Penix? Michigan's pass rush is among the best in the country. They pressured the quarterback on 43% of their dropbacks all season long. That's the fourth best in the FBS. Penix, conversely, behind the Joe Moore award-winning offensive line, was under pressure on just 24% of his dropbacks. That's the fourth lowest percentage in the FBS and the second lowest percentage in the Power Five. Now, Michigan's defense was the biggest difference maker when they played against Alabama. They had five sacks in the first half. Milrow was constantly under pressure, constantly under duress, and that front for Michigan, not just the front four, but really the front seven did an amazing job because they were really ramping things up as far as blitzes are concerned. Michigan blitzed Jalen Milrow 17 times. And in those 17 blitzes, they recorded nine pressures and five sacks. Now, pretty dang impressive because that was Michigan's most such sacks in the game this year and tied for their most in the last 10 seasons. So when they brought pressure, a guy was going to be unblocked and they were going to get home or they were going to cause some confusion along the offensive line or in the protection to be able to get a guy free. And Milrow did not succeed completing passes against the blitz. Usually, hey, when guys are coming, balls coming out, got to spit it out quick and you get some run after catch. Well, if you look at Alabama's run after catch numbers, they weren't very good. And Milrow completed just eight passes against the blitz for 37 yards and one first down. That's insane. When you are bringing extra guys, overloading the protection to complete only eight passes for 37 yards and one first down conversion, that tells you that the plan that they devised on that side of the ball was pretty remarkable. This will be a different animal though. Michael Penix is absurd. He's absurd. I referenced the downfield throws. So it's going to take some time for some of those downfield throws to materialize. One in particular against Texas, he held the ball for 3.57 seconds on the opening drive, and he hit Jalen Polk on a deep high post corner. That route takes time. Michael Penix held it for 3.56 seconds. That was plenty of time to deliver it down the field. 
the offensive line held up against a seven-man pressure. So they're pretty dang good in sorting out the protection. But when you get Michael Penix under pressure, he completes just 44% of his passes and averages about seven and a half yards per attempt. And his off-target percentage, meaning his uncatchable throw percentage, when he's under pressure, is at 21.3%. When he's not pressured, he completes 73% of his passes. He averages 9.5 yards per attempt. And his off-target percentage is just over 9%. So when he's under pressure, his yards per attempt go down by two yards. His completion percentage drops by about 30 points. And his off-target percentage really doubles. And actually more than doubles. From 21% to 9% pressure to no pressure. He had also not really a runner. He's only scrambled seven times this year, including one this past week against the Texas Longhorns. The offensive line has done a great job. They've allowed just 11 sacks. It's the fourth fewest in the country behind Oregon, Liberty, and West Virginia. Their left tackle, Troy Fautanu, is a third-team AP All-American. Their left guard, Nate Kalepo, big body. Julius Bulow, the right guard, really big body. Did miss some time, but he's now back healthy. And their right tackle, Roger Rosengarden, really feels more like a left tackle because Penix is a lefty. So he protects the blind side. He's a great player. And according to a couple publications, he was an All-American as well. But the guy that you got to watch is Parker Brailsford. He's only 275 pounds there in the middle of that defense. The Texas Longhorns try to take advantage of him. He held up pretty well. Now he's going to be working against a group that can also use their athleticism and their size against the undersized center. Because we talked for a while about just how good this front seven is, whether it's Harrell, McGregor, Graham, Jenkins, Moore, Grant, Stewart, Benny, Good, like, you name it, they got it, right? I think Harrell continues to be among their most disruptive guys as far as sacks and TFLs and pressures and all that stuff. He wears number 32. Josiah Stewart, who wears number five, I thought had a terrific game this past weekend, and he was the one that made the critical stop on Jalen Milrow on the fourth and goal. He completely bowled over the right tackle and made the play in the backfield, pushed J.C. Latham right in to the quarterback as he was running the quarterback power and knocked him down. So Josiah Stewart is coming off a nice performance, and he's going to be huge in this game as well, as is Braden McGregor, number 17, with Derek Moore and Kenneth Grant, who are kind of more of the run stoppers there in the middle, number eight, number 78, respectively. So that front seven against uh, Washington's offensive line and protection will be massive. That's key number one. Key number two, can Michigan eliminate the big play? Because Michigan's defense has very few weaknesses. Very few. On throws that are underneath, they dominate. They are so good on throws that are underneath. They're actually second in completion percentage allowed on throws that travel less than 20 yards downfield. The number one team in college football in that statistic are the Florida State Seminoles. So when the ball's underneath, they're really good. But they have, at times, given up some big plays. Entering the bowl season, Michigan has allowed a 36% completion percentage on passes that travel at least 20 yards. And I told you a moment ago, Michael Penix completes 53% of the passes that travel 30 plus yards. And Penix against Texas, he was able to stretch the field throughout the game, man. I mean, he was so good down the field. He completed seven passes that had 15 or more air yards, including two touchdowns. So he was really dialed in on the downfield stuff, and his receivers are ridiculous. Ridiculous, okay? And they're going to have their hands full. They are really going to have their hands full in being able to kind of slow down this passing attack. I mean, this is a group that averages 344 yards per game. That's number one in college football. It's actually up just ever so slightly with the performance against Texas because Penix went for 430 in that game, but they have become a little more balanced in September and October. They were two to one pass to run in November. It was more one to one, 55% pass, 45% run. So I do think them being a little bit more patient has been beneficial. And there have been times this year where Washington has been too aggressive. You look in the second half against Oregon state, the second half against Oregon, the first time around, 
Arizona State. There were a few times where they're just pushing the ball downfield too much. If you look at the Texas game, even, they get the fumble from Jaden Blue. They get a pass interference on a deep ball to Roma Dunze, and then they try a flea flicker, and they're still trying to push it downfield. Third down with the game basically uh, on the line where they could kick a field goal, run the clock. They decide to still throw it downfield. Like They're a little bit too aggressive at times, and I think Michigan can potentially take advantage of them being overly aggressive. So that's something that is absolutely worth documenting. Their trio of receivers are as good as anybody in college football. I know everyone says Ohio State. I disagree. I think this group is superior to that of Ohio State. I do. I know Ohio State fans will will strongly disagree. I would like to think that y'all know me by now. I really don't care. Like I think Roma Dunze is just as good as Marvin Harrison. Big physical wide receiver can stretch the field and did so multiple times against the Texas Longhorns. He's crazy productive, has a million targets, has gained 80 plus yards in 13 out of 14 games. The only game he didn't was against Arizona, where he had 64 yards. He's at 100 plus yards and a bunch as well. He's gotten stronger and he makes a ton of contested catches. He actually has 24 contested catches this season. That is ridiculous. That leads college football, probably because he gained 14 pounds of good weight this year so he can become stronger when the ball's in the air. Now, Jalen Polk, really good as well. He also has a bunch of contested catches. He has 20 contested catches as well. So he's in the top six or seven in college football as well. You got Jalen McMillan, who might be their most complete wide receiver as far as route running, run after the catch, creating separation. And if you talk to Steve Sarkeesian, the guy that stressed him out the most, what they had to defend was Jalen McMillan because they move him around. He's very capable at a bunch of different places. Jack Wostover, don't sleep on him as a tight end. He's excellent. Devin Culp was a little banged up in the game. But if he is healthy and available, he ran 10-6 in the 100 meter in high school and he's 240 pounds. So this guy can go, especially with vertical speed. It's going to be huge for Mike Sanders still, who's an excellent blitzer this year. Great feel there in the nickel. It's going to be huge for Josh Wallace. He's got to play big in the back end of this defense. Got to be huge for Will Johnson. Will Johnson is an elite corner. As the primary defender, he's allowing a QBR of 6.4. All right. He's given up just 13 completions this season. I mean, he's the real deal. So that trio has to be at their best when playing against this team. And they did a really good job against Alabama, limiting big plays because Alabama was a big play oriented offense. The difference between Alabama is it's not a full fledged attack where they have three or four guys running vertical. They would usually only have one or two guys running vertical. So this is a full court press from Washington trying to push the ball down the field and they are going to make some plays. They are going to make some plays. It's an inevitability. It will happen, but it's going to be up to the defense for Michigan and frankly, their pass rush to slow down the big play potential of the Washington Huskies. And then number three, key number three, can Washington slow down Michigan's run game? And we all know that the bell of the ball for Michigan is Blake Corum. 25 touchdowns this year after the semifinal against South Ham. That's only the most in Michigan history. That's five more than the next closest player. That was Hassan Haskins, who had 20 touchdowns back in 2021. He's also tied for the fifth most in Big Ten history. So he's averaging under five yards per carry. Not a big play guy, but he's going to get plenty of opportunities, plenty of totes. And there at the end of the game, he got stronger against Alabama. Donovan Edwards as well. So this is a really good tandem in the run game. And knowing the game's on the line, the championship's on the line, I would be highly surprised if there aren't some designed quarterback runs for J.J. McCarthy. He has that capability. So he is going to be impactful in the run game as well. And if you look at the numbers statistically for the Washington Huskies, Braylon Trice at times took over the game. He, he was amazing against the Texas Longhorns, statistically speaking. And from a production standpoint, the numbers aren't really there, but his impact is felt in every game. As a result, people see that number eight. They say, hey, we're going to make sure that we have a tight end over there. We're going to make sure our running back chips out and helps our tackle because he can't block that guy one on one. So what Washington has now evolved to, they're going to move him around a little bit. 
He's a great run stopper. He does a really good job creating issues in obvious passing situations. They also have Tuli Latuli Nasanoa. He's their best run stopper on the interior. And if you ask Washington's defense, he has been their best, their best run stopper all season long. So he's going to have to play at a really high level as well because this rushing attack is going to keep going, going to keep going, going to keep going. They are remarkably patient. Sharon Moore, the offensive coordinator, does a great job of trusting his offensive line to eventually figure it out and get to the point where they can push teams around in the third and fourth quarters. They are also probably going to play some keep away. So I would anticipate Washington doing a really, really good job trying to stretch the field. But I would anticipate Michigan's run game taking the air out of the football as much as humanly possible. Texas had success running the ball. The problem with Texas is Texas could not get out of their own way. They had penalties early. They were inefficient on first down. And as a result, they were getting in third down in long situations. But when they stayed on schedule, when they stayed on scripts, there were plenty of opportunities in the run game for C.J. Baxter and for Jaden Blue. Problem is C.J. Baxter put it on the deck, Jaden Blue put it on the deck, and turnovers, knowing both these teams' M.O., will be very important as well. So can Washington slow down Michigan's run game? That is question number three. I will not be picking the game. I will be calling it on the radio alongside Sean McDonough, Chris Budden, and Ian Fitzsimmons. So I will not pick the game, but I will, like I always do, give you some trends. Number one, Michigan is currently a four and a half point favorite over the Washington Huskies. Uh, Now, the betting favorite has won and covered four straight championship games. But in the first five years of the playoffs, underdogs were three and two outright and five and oh against the spread. So early on in the playoff, underdogs very successful. But as we now have come full circle here these last four years, the favorites have hammered when it comes to winning the game and winning the game at times convincingly. Another note in this one as well. Overs are 6-2-1 and one in college football title games. Now for Washington this year, overs are 8-6. and six. And for Michigan this year, and this note surprised me, they are 7-7. Seven and seven. So... Overs in Michigan games involving ranked teams are actually five and two. So the trends, the recent trends would tell you Michigan and the recent trends would tell you the over. Like I said, not a pick, just telling you the trends so you can choose accordingly. Every college football season, Goodyear knows the importance of winning on the road. The road will always demand confidence, the confidence to handle whatever the journey brings and to perform under tough conditions. And just like the players and fans of college football, Goodyear is ready. Are you ready for the road? Visit Goodyear.com to find the right Goodyear tires for whatever road you're on this season. Goodyear, more driven. I've heard all the different people explain just how important stars are and how this and that. And look, I love all the different publications that cover recruiting, whether it's 247. I am a, I am a subscriber to 247. Like I, I pay them my money too. Like I enjoy that. I enjoy it. I don't, I don't have time to watch high school prospects. Like I, I just need to, I need to, uh, I, I like, I like, I think they do a good job. I think they're well staffed. They put a lot of, of resources into recruiting. Now on three, very similar. They do a great job. I mean, every, all these teams and these people that cover recruiting are awesome. So I'm not disparaging them whatsoever. But there are schools that get the benefit of the doubt. So for instance, if Ohio State offers somebody, I do think there is some consideration towards improving that player that got offered, improving where they rank, because Ohio State's likely to be competing for championships. And if Ohio State has a bunch of players that are four and five stars, more people are going to subscribe to the service. I know how it works. It's okay. It's not a bad thing. I also subscribe to the service. But when you think about what Michigan and with Washington, what they are, Washington over the last few years, 2023, the 26th ranked recruiting class. They also brought in five transfers. 2022, 95th recruiting class. They brought in nine transfers. 21, 30th 
recruiting class. It brought in 10 transfers. 2020, 16th. 2019, 15th. Not one class that ranked better than 15th. But guess what they also have? A bunch of guys that have played a ton of football. And a couple of impact transfers that have taken their program from here and risen it up to a significant level. Michigan on the other side, a little bit more success on the recruiting trail, but not outrageous. Not up there alongside the likes of Alabama and Georgia and some of the teams that are constantly fixtures in the top five. They've been 17th. That's where they were this past year while bringing in nine transfers. 22nd. Then 2022, excuse me, they were ninth. Uh, They brought in three transfers. In 2021, they were 13th. They brought in four transfers. 2020, 10th. 2019, 8th. So in the last three years, they brought in 16 transfers. Washington, even in the midst of a coaching change, brought in 24 transfers. They haven't wholesale changed the roster. But the transfers that they've brought in have been really helpful. Really helpful. Veteran leadership is massive. Having a good core is massive. But if you can add pieces that can help you, that is also massive. Let's talk about the biggest transfers for a moment for Washington. Jeremy Bernard, he's like their number four wide receiver, plays quite a bit, has been featured and utilized in the Wildcat situation. He's been really good in the absence of Jalen McMillan. He's got 31 catches for 371 and two scores. He also has 12 carries for 39 yards and two touchdowns. So he's been pretty good after transferring over from Michigan State. Dylan Johnson is a transfer from Mississippi State. Started all 12 games and did miss the Tulsa game, but that was a million years ago. He rushed prior to the last game 201 times for 1,100 yards and 14 touchdowns. He also has caught 19 passes for 148. And if you think about Dylan Johnson, while he was banged up, should be good to go. So that was good news coming out of the game this past week that he's still going to be okay. He has a lingering foot injury, but hopefully it won't keep him out from the national championship. But he's done a really good job against their biggest opponents, not necessarily always their best defenses, because you look at the USC team. I mean, USC wasn't very good defensively, but... USC was a massive game for him, and they needed all 250-plus yards from Dylan Johnson to be able to get them over the top and win that game by 10 points. And then the, probably the biggest transfer they've added, arguably, is Jabbar Muhammad. Transfer from Oklahoma State. He's a corner, and he's the only guy that's started in all 13 games in the regular season and the Pac-12 title game. 42 tackles, bunch of tackles for loss, couple sacks, uh, three picks, Bunch of pass breakups, forced to fumble. He's been everything they needed him to be as their number one corner has been the most reliable piece in the secondary for Washington all season long. So, yes, Penix as well. Others have transferred in, but for the most part, it's homegrown guys that didn't necessarily choose to play for Kalen DeBoer, but bought in when Kalen DeBoer arrived and are now playing for a championship. Michigan's a little bit different. Uh, They brought in, like I said, nine transfer players this year. Drake Nugent, probably the biggest one, Uh, especially considering they had Olu Oluwatimi last year. Oluwatimi won the Remington and the Outland and was maybe the best center in the country. That was last year. Well, they went back to the portal and they brought in Drake Nugent from Stanford, and he's been really good. (laughs) First team all Big Ten by the coaches and the media. Finishes a finalist for the Remington. Uh, and has helped solidify an offensive line that had some turnover from last year to this year and was huge considering Zach Zinter was lost in the Ohio State game. Josh Wallace was also a piece that was a really nice addition. They had lost DJ Turner. They had lost Green. They'd lost RJ Moten, which means they had to go and get some veteran experience in the back end, and they got it with Josh Wallace, who transferred over from UMass. So he's kind of been all over the place, played some corner, uh, and got all Big Ten honorable mention from the media and from the coaches. So he's done, I think, a pretty good job of, of playing good coverage and has been really sound. He's also, I think, been pretty physical as well, which has been huge. Ladarius Henderson, uh, after Ryan Hayes left after 22, they really needed Ladarius Henderson to step in and to fill the void. Yeah, made eight starts at left tackle, uh, played in all 12 games, 
So it might have taken a little time for him to kind of settle in. He eventually established himself as the starter and went on, I think, to have a really solid year. A.J. Barner has been huge at tight end. Colson Loveland's the headliner, but A.J. Barner, a lot of people think he's got a really high ceiling and has been a piece really from early in the year to give Michigan that 12 personnel, those two tight ends, those big body threats that will work the middle of the field. He went off. Uh, against Michigan State when he had nearly 100 yards in the touchdown. And then finally, what about James Turner? After Jake Moody left, the kicker, there were some pretty dang big shoes to fill. So they had to go and get the kicker from Louisville and, and James Turner, who has stepped in and has done a pretty admirable job uh, hitting 16 of 18 in, in the regular season, even though he had a bit of a shaky game against Alabama in the Rose Bowl. So he was pretty big in the Ohio State game. <laughs> hit all three of his field goal attempts, including a 50 yarder to help secure the victory. So you think about where things have been with how these teams have been created. It's okay to lean on homegrown talent. And for those that panic when their team and their recruiting class is filled with three stars and low level four stars, it's okay. They might be just the guys you need to be around for four and five years to buy in without needing NIL support to what your coach is doing. And that's what's happened at Michigan, and that's what happened at Washington. And now they'll tee it up Monday for the national championship. Mmm, you smell that? That's the scent of fresh turf and freshly cracked Dr. Pepper, which can only mean one thing. It's college football season. So block off your Saturdays and swipe a sweet Dr. Pepper from the mini fridge because there's a new season of high kicks, long throws, and Fansville commercial breaks to carry you all the way to the West Coast games. That's right, the fans are back and this year things are heating up. We're talking about hot takes, more heartbreak, more layers of face paint. Get ready to drink in all the drama this season with the help of the most delicious college football tradition there is, Dr. Pepper, the one fans deserve. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Please continue to like, rate, and subscribe to the show. Wherever you get your show, it doesn't matter where, just go ahead and like, rate, and subscribe. If you could, that'd be awesome. Whatever you rate, you want to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, that's awesome as well. We've had a great time. Our numbers, we just got our year-end numbers from 2023. Uh, let's just say the downloads were significant. Uh, and the viewership on YouTube was outrageous. Maybe we'll tell you those numbers. We don't know if we can. We don't know if we should. But either way, they were awesome. And they were awesome because of you guys. We appreciate y'all so much. We will be here all weekend long previewing the game. Of course, today's show, you can watch this whenever, but we'll have actual content coming from site in Houston. I'll be leaving for Houston here very, very soon. We'll have stuff on Saturday, stuff on Sunday. And of course, we'll have plenty for you both on Monday before the kick and after the game where I'll be calling the game on ESPN radio alongside Sean McDonough, Chris Budden, and Ian Fitzsimmons. So for all of us here at Always College Football, continue, continue to support the show and know that we're going to be here for you leading up to the biggest game of the college football season. For all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an amazing day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.